Hello, my friends. How are you doing today? Are you having a good day? I hope you're having a good day. Thank you so much for clicking on this video today and being here. I really appreciate it. I'm quite excited about this video. It's been a long time coming. I've talked about my thoughts and feelings about behaviorism before, but never really as specific or as in-depth as this will be. If this is your first time seeing me, hi, nice to meet you. My name is Paige Leal. You may know me from TikTok. If you're not doing so already, feel free to check out my TikTok at Paige Leal. And while you're at it, you can follow my Instagram with the same name. I am autistic. And so over here, we talk about autism and stuff. And we have a pretty good time, if I do say so myself. If you are not new here and you are already my friend, hi, good to see ya, diarrhea. Thank you all for being here. Before we continue, just want to let y'all know that I do post content every Friday. If you are interested in learning more about autism and or more about me, if you like hanging out with me, you can subscribe and come hang out every Friday. Before we get into any of this, I want to know what you guys know about behaviorism right now. You could take a minute, pause the video, and sound off below in the comments. What do you know about behaviorism? What do you think or feel about behaviorism? How is behaviorism applied today in real life? Do you agree? Do you like it? I'm gonna come back at the end of the video and ask you guys to go back down in your comment and see if anything has changed. I'm very interested to see um, how everyone reacts and how everyone feels. So please sit back, relax, grab a snack, and allow me to introduce my video essay on why behaviorism is invalid. We can't talk about my opinions on behaviorism until we all are under the same understanding of what behaviorism is. Behaviorism is the theory that psychology can be studied through observable action. In the 19th century, it was heavily theorized and believed that psychology was observed through thoughts and feelings. But because thoughts and feelings are not tangible things that can be measured, some psychologists began to believe that measuring psychology in this way was just too subjective. And thus they started looking at alternative ways. There are a lot of scientists that have influenced the behaviorism field. And it was in 1913 that behaviorism began being used by Watson and became heavily used in the 1920s. Behaviorism theorizes that not only can psychology be studied through your actions, but that your actions come from learned behaviors and you learn behaviors through conditioning. There are a few different ways that behaviors are conditioned. One example is classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is the idea of associating two unrelated stimuli with each other by having the same response to both stimuli. In order to connect two unrelated stimuli to each other, one needs to have a natural reaction already to one of the stimuli. In Pavlov's dog's experiment, the dogs were classically conditioned to salivate at the sound of a bell. Now, how did that work? Those seem like two unrelated things, hearing a bell and then salivating. To start off, you need to have that behavior with one of the stimuli. In this case, dogs would salivate when they were presented with food which was their natural behavior to being presented with food. At the time they were being fed, a bell would sound. The dogs began associating the bell with meaning that they were going to be fed. And so the dogs would begin to salivate at just the sound of the bell. Another type of conditioning is called operant conditioning. Whereas classical conditioning primarily focuses on creating a new behavior, operant conditioning is more about reinforcing a behavior. Operant conditioning is the idea that one learns behavior by associating it with the consequence. In an experiment done by putting a mouse in a box, the mouse navigated the box and learned that when it stepped on a particular button, food would come. And so every time they were hungry, they would run and step on the button. That is an example of a behavior that is reinforced by a positive reward. Now in a similar experiment, there was a box and there was a mouse, but instead the mouse would be electrocuted if they did not step on the button. This is an example of reinforcing a behavior with a negative reinforcement. If you look at the nature versus nurture debate, with nature being the idea that you are who you are because you were born that way, with nurture being you are who you are because you learned to be that way, behaviorism implies that we are who we are because we learned to be that way through reinforcing behaviors with punishments or rewards or by associating two stimuli with each other and creating a behavior on a different stimuli. We know that behavioral psychology was very big in the 1920s. You may think, is there a lot of behaviorism happening right now? They seem more like vague concepts, perhaps, than being applied in real life. And that is because you are right. Behaviorism was not used primarily for very long. Cognitive psychology began to be developed because it was viewed that behaviorism was a very basic 
simple lens of even the most complex learning situations. Cognitive psychology was the idea that behavior and thoughts and feelings were connected. And so in the 1940s, cognitive psychology began to take off and we've kept going off since. There are still common examples of people using behaviorism every day. At the end of every year, the kids get their report cards back. To entice them to work hard and get good grades, Jimmy's parents had to deal with him. They would give him $5 for every A on his report card, two dollars for every B, and one dollar for every C. But every D, they would take away three dollars. Because Jimmy was enticed by the money that he would receive at the end of the year, he tried his very best to work hard to make as much money as possible. This is an example of using both positive and negative reinforcement to encourage a behavior. Another example, little Cindy was crying in the grocery store. Her mother did not like her behavior. She did not want this behavior to be reinforced, so she punished the behavior. Cindy's mother spanked the little girl to try to deter her from behaving like this again. Not only is this negative reinforcement or a punishment, but it is also classical conditioning. Cindy is then conditioned to associate crying with being spanked, which then encourages Cindy to cry less, especially in front of her mother, to avoid being spanked and hurt. Another example of conditioning is gay conversion therapy. All of these examples still exist today. But, and as I'm sure that you might be thinking right now, those don't sound like the most current tactics that we use. That sounds very, uh, a few, a few decades ago for sure. So what happened to behaviorism? A common argument I am faced when I discuss behaviorism is that everything is behavior. You don't go to work unless you get paid, do you? The only reason anyone does things is because they are rewarded for doing so. And to that I say, no, absolutely not. People behave in all kinds of ways, this is true. But I disagree that behavior tells us motive. But I am not denying that behaviorism does exist and can be observed. That is primarily the whole idea why it was discovered or created. For example, if you were to ask your friend for help and they responded very poorly to your asking, you may learn not to ask them for help. And that is your behavior being influenced by the negative reinforcement. Or if I touch a stove when it's on and it's hot and I get burned, I then know to not do that behavior next time. I will say that there are instances where things can be as simple as to just describe behavior, but that's only if things are simple. But even in the simplest cases, I still believe that there is more than meets the eye when it comes to how a person behaves. Behaviorism skips so many steps of learning and understanding. It's a very, very basic overview of what's going on. It's perhaps the main an idea. You're asking a friend for help. What are you thinking and feeling? Maybe you're thinking and feeling defeated. Maybe you are begging for help. Maybe it's your final straw. Maybe you're just asking your friend for help to move the couch. Maybe you're asking them to be the best man in your wedding. Whatever it is, you're thinking and feeling it and you're asking your friend for this thing. Are you asking them because you want to? Are you asking them because you have to? How do you feel about their response? Are you hurt? Do you feel abandoned? Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you happy? This theory was created a hundred years ago. And since then we've developed so much more in cognitive psychology. There are still individuals that use behaviorism. Some people learn about others' behaviors and learn how to condition them to behave a certain way. And they are within their right to do that, I guess. Parents can use behaviorism on their children. Teachers can use it on their students. Dog owners can use it on their dogs. But there is one field of study and area of expertise that is specifically devoted to behaviorism. And because behaviorism is a theory of psychology, my main focus here on behaviorism today is behavioral therapy. We know that babies cry and often they cry a lot. Sleep training a baby can be a difficult task. What do you do when you want your baby to sleep? and all your baby is doing is crying. You may have heard of sleep training in a way of teaching the baby to self-soothe. That looks like putting your baby down to sleep. And when your baby starts to cry, you ignore the baby and leave the baby alone. By leaving the baby alone, the baby will have to cry it out and learn to soothe themselves. The baby will eventually learn that crying is no use because their cries are being ignored and therefore the crying lessens and lessens. This is behaviorism again. The behavior that we want changed is crying and so we need to make crying seem like a negative thing. We negatively reinforce the behavior. Women have been doing this for ages and they do it because 
we know it works. But just because something works doesn't mean that it's good. We also know that babies develop attachments with their caregivers. And we know that the attachments that you have with the people that raise you influence the relationships that you then continue to have for the rest of your life. And this is one of the first times that the baby learns what the relationship is and thus creates some attachment wounds. We also know that babies are not manipulative. Babies are not crying for no reason. Babies can't be selfish. They're a baby. They need you to survive and they have special things about them like crying that are made as communication to signal to their caregiver that they need something to survive. And by ignoring that, the baby can grow up to believe that they cannot trust their parents or the people take care of them. They may feel that no one cares when they are upset. They are not comforted when they they're upset, being upset pushes people away from them. I could say more, but the rest is really up to whatever else happens in their life. And this does seem, I do seem to be snowballing a little bit here. I'm very passionate about learning about attachment wounds and raising your children in the best way possible. So forgive my tangents here. But all in all, we know that by letting your baby cry it out and self-soothe, it works. The behavior that you want to stop happening will stop happening, but not without causing a bunch of other issues. That can cannot be repressed forever and will come to the surface. If not, it will work subconsciously. Despite things that we know about behavior, behavioral therapy is still going strong to this day. And as the big kahuna, the all-encompassing detriment of behaviorism is a little something called A, B, A. Now, I know you guys have heard me talk about ABA before lots on this channel. I will tag a video up in the eye and you can go and watch that. But as a brief overview, ABA stands for Applied Behavior Analysis. It is a very common, perhaps the most common autism therapy. Ah yes, Paige. I see why this is relevant for you. Personally, I've said that ABA is uh, not good. And I've also said that Autism Speaks is not good. If you want more information on that, I have a video up in the eye right now about why Autism Speaks is trash. But Autism Speaks and ABA are like best friends. So I went to Autism Speaks to see how they would define ABA so you could get their view as well as mine. From Autism Speaks, the goal of ABA is to increase helpful behaviors and decrease behaviors that are harmful and affect learning. Of course, it's behaviorism, it's behavior-based, and it's about changing behaviors. ABA has been in effect since the 1960s, which, mind you, Cognitive psychology began in the 1940s, and so we are post-cognitive psychology days when ABA became a hit. ABA is skill-based, which means it is doing things based. It is behaving in a certain way based. Now, if you want more videos and more examples of ABA in real life, look up in the eye, there is another video for you. May I present to you my main idea. Behaviorism is an outdated basic science that should not be individualized and focused on because human psychology is much more complex than behavior and ignoring that is wrong morally and scientifically. The Oxford Dictionary defines manipulation as behavior that controls or influences somebody or something often in a dishonest way so that they do not realize it. Manipulation is also defined as to sway someone to get them to feel or act a certain way. I believe that is all behaviorism is. I believe in behaving a certain way, but not for the same reasons. And I definitely don't believe in enforcing it in the same way. Am I saying that I believe that children should just get to do whatever they want? put themselves and others in danger? Absolutely not. That is not at all what I am saying. I am saying that they should not be manipulated into acting the way that you want them to. Allow me to show some mirror examples. I'm going to describe a scenario and I'm going to give the behaviorism way of dealing with the scenario and then my way. It's more cognitive psychology. So here is our scenario. Your child's principal calls you in the middle of the day and they say that little Jennifer peed her pants while she was at school. Jennifer is four years old. It is her first month in kindergarten and she's having a little bit of a hard time adjusting. She doesn't pee in her pants all of the time, but it's happening enough that it does seem to be a problem. The behavior that we wish to change is the peeing of the pants. So how do we go about doing that. In the behaviorism way, we know that we have to make peeing in your pants negative. We can either 
negatively reinforce the behavior, we can positively reinforce the opposite of the behavior, or we can associate a negative reaction that she has to a different stimuli to this act of peeing her pants as well. Using positive reinforcement would look like giving Jennifer a treat every day she doesn't pee in her pants, or congratulating her every time she uses the bathroom. And a reminder, that the positive reward is not given if she does have an accident. If we wanted to use negative reinforcement, that would be things like shaming Jennifer and yelling at her and humiliating her. Which side note, I would also argue that negative reinforcement is just classical conditioning, where you are associating two unrelated stimuli with the same reaction. Like you get candy if you don't pee in your pants. Cool, now I associate not peeing in your pants as a good thing. Anyway, what does the child learn in this situation? They learn that peeing in their pants is wrong or bad. And that is all. So how will they feel if they do pee in their pants? How will they feel if someone else pees in their pants? I don't want to snowball into what feelings do to cause behavior. I would argue that we don't know what behavior someone will produce just because we know the why. So these will be inferences. I infer that if a child feels like peeing in their pants is wrong or bad, and they know they will either get punished or not have a reward, they may feel things like shame, sadness, fear, anger, embarrassment. What negative behaviors could come from this? Jennifer peed her pants again. Jennifer doesn't want her parents to know that she peed her pants again because she knows that they're going to yell at her and she knows that she won't be able to have dessert for a week. So what does Jennifer do? She could think she messed up so bad and she's worthless and something must be wrong with her. Maybe Jennifer hides her underwear and lies to her parents. Maybe her parents believe her and then she knows that she can lie to her parents. Maybe Jennifer throws a tantrum and yells and screams at her mom when her mom says no dessert for a week. These are all negative behaviors that could come from this. What are the positive ones? I could see some saying, Jennifer feels disappointed and from that disappointment, she feels the need to do better in the future. She gets better, she learns, she grows, she accepts the punishment, she takes it with grace, and she moves forward. I would say that I could see that being a possibility, and I could see a lot of people saying that. So allow me to argue, because that's what I do over here, is argue about everything. Behaviorism implies that by not doing something, it is because you are not motivated to do something. It encourages you to do certain things by giving you the motivation to do certain things. It implies no prior thoughts or feelings or independent opinions, nor does it take into account what the person is capable of doing. And I would say that the reason why kids are the way that they are is not just because they are motivated to be that way. This is a little bit of a nature versus nurture debate, but we know that both nature and nurture play large roles in the human experience. And I'd say that trying to please your parents is not a value that I uphold and it's not a value that I really think anyone should. I think living your life to please someone else is not good. I don't personally think that children enjoy having pee in their pants. Let's go over the situation again, but now I'm gonna tell you what I would do. So we return back to our situation with Jennifer. We just got a call from the principal's office saying that Jennifer has wet her pants today. We are still thinking the same thing, and which is that we would like Jennifer to not pee in her pants. That is a behavior, and that is a behavior that we wish to change. But in this case, we are not going to train Jennifer to do something that we want her to do. Or personally, I'll start saying me, what I want her to do. I'm not going to train her because I want Jennifer to be her own person and have her own thoughts and opinions and do what she thinks is right. And why I say that is because I'm fairly certain that what she thinks is right is also what I think is right, which is neither of us want her to pee her pants at school. Instead of training a behavior, I would teach and communicate things that already exist, things that are already happening, and just show them to Jennifer and explain them to her and work on them together. Do kids pee their pants because of lack of motivation to not do so? Sure, I guess, some kids, I'm sure. But as a 
former child who has had accidents in her life at some point. I know that it is not correct for 100% of cases that children pee their pants because they are not motivated not to. So I would find out why are we peeing our pants in school? There could be a lot of reasons and in behaviorism these reasons are overlooked and ignored. Maybe Jennifer has a hard time recognizing when her body needs to go to the bathroom. Maybe she has trouble listening for those cues that her body tries to tell her. Maybe she didn't have time to go to the bathroom. Bathroom. Maybe a bathroom wasn't available to her or the teacher wouldn't allow her. Maybe Jennifer had a really, really big emotion that caused her to lose control of her body for a bit. Maybe Jennifer doesn't know that she's supposed to go to the toilet when she has to go to the bathroom. Maybe Jennifer is showing physical signs of some kind of disorder. And maybe this is a physical mechanical problem rather than a psychological one. I would communicate with Jennifer, find out what is going on, and then work from there to change the behavior by going to the source. If Jennifer has a hard time listening to body cues, I would work with her on listening to her body and identifying what certain things feel like and mean and what they motivate us to do. Not what I motivate her to do or what a behavior or a reinforcement motivates her to do, but what she motivates herself to do what her body tells her to do. Then Jennifer becomes more in tune with her body, recognizes when she has to go to the bathroom and has much fewer accidents. If Jennifer found she had no time, maybe she played all recess and by the time recess was done, she had to go to the bathroom, but she had to go back to class. Perhaps then I would work with her on time management. Maybe at every lunch break, she should begin with going to the bathroom. If she had a really big emotion that caused her to lose control of her body, we would go over emotions, how they feel like in your body, and emotional regulation and maturity. How to feel your emotion, how to ride it out, how to recover, how to cope, as well as time management to make sure that if a big emotion does happen, our bladder is not at its fullest point. If Jennifer wasn't sure that this is what we do, then I explain it to her. If there was a physical problem with Jennifer's body, that's funny. <laughs> we take her to the doctor and get it figured out. In all of these situations, we found out why the behavior was happening. And instead of resorting to adjusting behavior by reinforcement, we resorted to adjusting behavior by learning and by connecting. And not only did we change the behavior, we changed the thing that was not fun that was causing the behavior. In this situation, the child learns important information that is helpful and useful and healthy to know, and they can use that knowledge forever. The child also learns that there is no good or bad. People mess up sometimes, but the child learns that they are not shamed for being a human person. They are loved and they are heard and they are imperfect. And those things all coexist. They also learn problem solving behaviors, different tactics, strategies that they can use next time. We all have seen those children crying at the movie theater or the airplane or the supermarket and we can't help but pay attention. And of course, we notice what the parents are doing, how the parents are responding to their child's outburst. I think that a lot of us think of how would we handle that situation? What would we do? I will say that it is most often for me personally, tell me if I'm wrong from you guys, that a child is acting out because of or in conjunction with their parents reacting and communicating and teaching by using behaviorism. There's a little girl on the floor of the supermarket. We're in the dairy section and Chloe here is just losing her mind. Chloe's dad bends over and talks to Chloe. Chloe's father knows that she is very young and doesn't know why she feels the way that she feels all of the time. It's hard to regulate these big emotions in such a small body. Chloe's dad tries to help her out when he remembers that Chloe did not get very much sleep last night and that Chloe has been demonstrating signs of tiredness all day. That can make a lot of things very difficult to process. Chloe's dad talks about the potential of Chloe being tired and tells her that her yawning indicates that she is tired. He apologizes for taking her somewhere where she had to do a lot of analyzing when she just wasn't ready to do so. He says he understands that she is very upset and frustrated right now and that she is allowed to feel those emotions because they are real. Then he asks if Chloe can do just 10 more minutes of grocery shopping and then they will go home and she can sleep in the car and as soon as she gets home. Chloe, now feeling safe, comforted, and knows that her needs are about to be met, feels hurt and validated. 
and continues to walk along with her father for the next 10 minutes in the grocery store without crying and without laying on the floor and without problems because she trusts her caregiver and knows that her needs are going to be met. Now, I know we're getting a little repetitive, but I wanna show you all of these different scenarios to show how behaviorism works in multiple different scenarios. Yes, my grandparents used to get hit with the wooden spoon when they were in school and my parents used to get spanked when they were bad, but everyone learned and my parents didn't hit me because we know that that isn't good for children. So what is the point? The DSM-5 or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition with a text revision, is a document written by the American Psychiatric Association featuring the most current up-to-date information that America has on mental and developmental disorders. I am a human with a funky brain. How do you know if your brain is doing anything funky? This manual is like a checklist for diagnosing disorders. And it is a manual that a psychiatrist would use when assessing someone for a certain disorder. Here I'm just going to share some of the criteria needed for an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. Insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines, highly restricted fixated interests, repetitive motor movements, deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction, difficulties in sharing imaginative play or in making friends. Symptoms cause clinically significant impairment. Symptoms must be present in early developmental period. Is there something that you notice about all of those things? They're all behaviors. The same can be said for almost every single diagnosis within the DSM-5. As a person who talks about autism all of the time and is autistic, I know that I will never get something 100% right. I know that there are like no things that I can say about autism that 100% of autistic people are going to personally agree with. I will never be right about autism because behaviorism will never be right. Until psychology, and specifically mental and developmental disorders, are not based on behavior, and instead are based on causation, which I think includes both nature, the genetics of your brain, how your brain developed, and nurture, which can also impact how your brain developed epigenetics. Until we use neuroscience to diagnose disorders instead of behavior, Disorders will continue to be misunderstood. Do we diagnose a heart attack by seeing if the person is wincing in pain and clutching their chest? Do we diagnose a broken foot by seeing that the person's not putting weight on their foot? Do we diagnose food poisoning if someone is vomiting? No, we don't. You can make those assumptions based on the behavior and maybe you'd be right. But someone also winces in pain and grabs their chest if they've been stung by a bee in their chest. Someone may wince in pain and grab their chest if someone just threw a baseball at their chest and they caught it. Someone may not be putting weight on their foot because they tore a ligament. Or maybe it's actually their hip that's bothering them or their knee. And that person vomiting could just be hungover. It's not enough to diagnose on what you can see behavior wise. We have so much machinery that helps us diagnose so many disorders. X-rays to help you look at bones. We have MRIs, CAT scans, blood tests. We can look at things that are seemingly invisible. We can look inside of a person to confirm what is going on with everything except for your brain. I'm sure you've heard me say it. I'm sure you've heard a lot of people say it before that every autistic person is different. Each autistic person is different than the next. I do not, nor have I ever claimed to speak for any other autistic person other than myself. Each of us are so unique. We each have our own challenges, our own interests, our own traits. We see the world differently. We see each other differently and other people see us differently. Why then do we all behave differently if all of the autistic people adhere to this written behavioral criteria that psychiatrists follow, still, why are we all so different? And this is because behavior does not give us a detailed and accurate and therefore a correct view of psychology. I think it's impossible to base everything on behavior. And as long as we accept that, I'm fine. I understand that behaviorism can be a, oh, I see a behavior, I don't like it, what do we do? Okay, that's great. If it's simple like that, that's, you know, it's fine. 
people behave behavior does exist but end it there behaviorism is too subjective the dsm-5 does not say what the brain looks like in autistic people and it is because of what our brain looks like that then influences the way we see the world and the way we see the world and interact with our surroundings influences our behavior However, every single person is going to have different behavior. Behaviorism doesn't matter because behavior does not tell you anything else and it's the everything else that is important. Behavior is what happens as a result of all of the other things. Say you're climbing a mountain and at the very, very top of the mountain is a negative behavior, whatever it is, whatever, whoever this behaviorist is interprets as negative, whatever they say is negative, it's on top of the mountain, okay? And you're climbing it. And each step that you take is a different thing happening on the inside. The behavior is the last thing that you are going to get to. A behavior is the result of climbing this mountain. Your thoughts on the current situation, your feelings, past experiences, do you have any biases? Childhood trauma, attachment wounds. Behaviorism wants to change the behavior by simply changing the behavior. So instead of getting to the top of that mountain, you jump off onto a different mountain at the last second. Now you have a different behavior. Cool, 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 cool. But what if you just climbed that mountain? It's so much smaller and it's a better outcome that makes everyone much more happy. Why would I climb this big, mounted that I hated the entire time if I was just going to go over there. You still have to climb that big mountain and have all of those thoughts and feelings, but you're supposed to behave a different way, even though all of the thoughts and the feelings that you have lead you to almost needing to behave that way. Why wouldn't you just not climb the mountain? Because it's harder, because manipulation works because it is easier to train a child than it is to teach them all of the things that you did wrong. It's easier to convince a child to act a certain way out of motivation. To get to the bottom of the mountain requires that person, that adult, that behaviorist who's in charge to meet the child at the bottom of the mountain. And most adults don't even know that there is a bottom of the mountain. We have never seen a sane adult human. Humans are imperfect. Humans have trauma. Humans have been taught and raised imperfectly forever. Things have happened in all of our lives that suck and that we didn't deserve and that shouldn't have happened. But we all have to accept that they did happen and they made us who we are. It's very hard for an adult to teach a child things that the adult doesn't even know themselves. And why bother if you can change behavior with manipulation? Behaviorism involves another person who makes the decisions which then another person must comply. There is a hierarchy of importance and of knowledge. And also the motives do not matter. What does matter is Doing good, doing the right thing by whoever's standards in order to get the reward. And if you don't do the right thing, you will get punished. Hmm, does this sound like anything in, in particular? Giving money to the homeless, great thing, cool, 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 cool. But if you only do it because the cameras are on, is it that good of a thing? Getting good grades in school just so you can get money from your parents. You make someone happy because they will treat you good if you make them happy. Is that the same as just wanting to treat people good? Is that behaviorism? Wanting to please somebody? Needing to please somebody for your own safety and maybe survival? Behaviorism is all about someone else's standards standards of you. It's about what everyone else thinks of you externally and has nothing to do with what you think of yourself. It is about pleasing someone else that is not you based on arbitrary standards that they created, that you are supposed to blindly follow and not question. They have more power than you. They can and will punish you if you question them. Oftentimes the people that use behaviorism are not the smartest people that should be a uh, telling people what to do. Scary, scary, scary. Which brings me to the point of ABA therapy and why I have such big problems here. That's to do with the manipulation we talked about and how that impacts autistic people later on after the ABA is done. Quick hot take, 
I, uh, behaviorism doesn't teach skills. That's like one of the main things about ABA. They say, we teach independence. We can teach your kid how to do independent things. I don't think that teaching skills is about behavior. Behavior is the end goal, but you need everything else first. If someone came up to me and said, hey, I will give you $100,000 to swim across Lake Ontario. They want my behavior to be swimming across Lake Ontario. And now they've given me the motivation to do it. If I did it, that is not teaching me the skill of swimming across Lake Ontario. And it wasn't my lack of motivation that was preventing me from doing it in the first place. It was the fact that one, I don't want to. That would be extremely difficult. It would be time consuming. It would be cold. There would be animals and such. It would probably be dangerous. Which leads me to my second point. I'm not like an excellent swimmer. I'm no Olympic athlete. I am no Miguel Phelps. If someone said swim this really hard thing for money and if you don't do it, it's uh, because you suck. You don't have the motivation to. And if you do do it, then I get the credit. I taught you how to do that. No, you just told me you'd give me $100,000 if I did. I didn't want to do it. I wanted $100,000. Oh, but I died along the way because I can't swim that well. <laughs> if you wanted to teach me skills, take me to swimming lessons first. And maybe one day I'll feel the urge to swim across Lake Ontario. People can just not do things sometimes. If your child has very poor fine motor skills and is having trouble tying shoelaces, what if he just didn't wear shoelaces? Behaviorism teaches compliance. It teaches, you must please me, do not question me, I know better than you, and you are going to do as I say, not because you want to, but because you want what I will offer you if you do. You can teach skills without behaviorism. And actually I believe that you can teach skills more effectively without behaviorism. Learning to comply and perform to be rewarded is not independence to me. Life doesn't exist like that because most people get to have their own values and their own opinions that they get to live their life by. But anyone who is being trained by a behaviorist does not. For any ABA people or behaviorists get up in here and say, well, some people aren't doing ABA right and those people aren't included in the ABA. We don't like them, they're not doing it right. The people that are doing ABA wrong are doing it better because ABA in itself is wrong because behaviorism is wrong. That's all that I have to say about that. What happens if the behaviorist is gone? What happens when the parents are gone? What happens when no one is around to tell this child what to do? Or what happens if the child starts having a sense of identity and begins to realize, I don't like this, but I have to do this to please my mom because pleasing my mom is the most important thing. I have to please everyone else before myself. What do I do? From personal experience too, I will tell you that that will cause an identity crisis. If a child has to perform for someone, it's going to cause so many issues that I'm sure you guys understand and recognize. I don't believe you can train someone to independence. I think that it's very sad that children are put in this position because they have to conform for their safety. They will do what you want them to do because they need to be safe. I learned firsthand that I was responsible for how everyone felt because people treated me better when they were happy. And in order for me to be safe, I had to make other people happy. Like even with my dog, man, she was trained to be a service dog and Macy wasn't even trained in just behavior. We have enough science today to know that animals aren't even just their behavior. And when it comes to training animals, literally almost like doing ABA on your animals, it's still better than ABA. It is still taking into account everything else about that animal, not just their behavior. I don't understand why we still do it. Perhaps we don't have the vicinities for that big man to diagnose disorders based on the actual makeup of the brain and the different things that are going on. But we need to be getting there because diagnosing on behavior is incorrect. So in conclusion, basing anything on behavior is dumb. Behavior is so simple and so superficial. Humans are not just behavior. If it worked, there would be no jail. Apparently I'm throwing in an example in my conclusion statement. There would be no bad people because we could just change behaviors. Easy peasy. We could just threaten people with punishments if they're bad. 
and then people won't be bad. Mm, I did, I did go there. Anyway, I think that's all that I'm going to say about this, actually. I don't think anyone can change my mind because the world of psychology as a whole is continuing to build off of and thus push away behaviorism for the last 80 years. So I don't think anyone's going to convince me to go backwards. Tell me what you think. Do you still have the same thoughts and feelings and opinions that you did at the beginning of this video? I'd love to hear about it. Comment down below. And thank you guys for sitting and hanging out with me. If you guys enjoyed this video, you may enjoy some of my other videos. You could subscribe if you wanted to. Oh, and I'm doing this new thing. I think I'm probably going to add it. I don't have end cards of my videos up until now. Now I'm gonna make an end card and I have a little ending song uh, that I just made up randomly one day. It's 14 seconds long and it's gonna play at the end of every video so y'all know when a video's done. And in that end card, I'll have like all the buttons that you click on things and whatever. Um, I'm a YouTuber, baby. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for caring and thank you for learning. I will see you next Friday. Take it away, ending song. This is the end of the video song. This video is to tell you the video's done. If you're hearing this, it's because the video's done. Go watch another one. Boop, boop. Have a good day. Love you so much. Bye.